Good evening. Top five of good day. Kalash in the whole skull of black here. Um, we thought we were going to have to occupy the place here. Because uh, some of you may know there was a power outage earlier and we thought we would have to postpone the whole thing until another, another date. But uh, happily not the case. And uh, lovely to see you all here. Uh, we, we, had a, we had invited Cliff Richard to come and perform The Young Ones. <laughs> But uh, unfortunately, he can't make it. Um, but uh, it's great to see you all looking so well. Um, after the, uh, we won't mention how long ago it is, since the gender revolution. And uh, we, have a, we have a great panel here tonight. Uh, I'm Deglon de Bredon, and if, if you want to show your age, you can call me Declan Breeden. Um, you, you, some of, many of you will know some members of the panel. Uh, Basil Miller, of course, was a, a key figure in the Gentle Revolution uh, and uh, economics graduate. And um, Nicole Pepinster, another uh, very active participant. Frank MacDonald uh, is currently uh, the author of Truly Frank, a Dublin memoir published by Penguin. Okay, Frank? Uh, <laughs> which is in the shops and uh, I have read it and I would urge you all to, to, to buy it and read it, but buy it anyway. Uh, and, uh, it's a great read. It's a great read, it really is, it really is, um, unless you get mentioned in unfavorable terms in it. But I'm happy to say the only negative sounding word he had about me was he described me as laconic, which I, I'm not quite sure what, what that means, but, uh, um, it sounds a, you know, vaguely close to cynical, but uh, but you could never say that about a journalist. And 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 then we're going to have a brief uh, presentations from each of the three um, SDA survivors, and then um, Amy Crean will, they, who represents the young generation of student activists, will respond. Uh, Amy is an award-winning debater and a well-known activist in, in her generation and we will be getting her reaction to see if there's anything in common between the two eras. For example, housing was a big issue and I know it's a big issue for today's uh, student activists. So uh, without any further ado, we'll give the floor to Basil Miller. Well, thank you all for coming, first of all. Uh, we weren't sure if anyone would show up after all this time. Um, I'm not going to say very much to start with because uh, I like the notion of a, a conversation, really, about those events years ago and what they meant. So um, what I've been asked to do is just to say what my role at the time was, and uh, that's what I'll do. Um, I was one of the founders of Students for Democratic Action, and that came from a meeting, as you can imagine, in a flat in Ranala in May 1967. And I can see two of the other people who were there, at least two, uh, present tonight, Morris Sweeney and Una Claffey. And I'm delighted to see there's at least three of us here. Um, the others were, uh, Rory Quinn, who can't be with us tonight because he's out of the country, and Paddy Wally, whom I don't see about the place either. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't something that happened out of the blue. Uh, three of the people there were members of the university branch of the Labour Party, which was in those days left-wing, and <laughs> as were we. It was the, that time when there was a slogan going about, or maybe it was a year later, uh, the 70s will be socialist. And I won't remind you of the transformation of that in a few years later. Um, so, you know, we had a certain background. We had uh, learnt something about left-wing politics, and we were obviously influenced by events which we could see in the wider world around us 
uh, which had been going on for quite some time. So the obvious influence uh, in May 1968 was the events in France, which were uh, very much uh, a clear example of a revolutionary wave in society. And I do think we strongly believed, witnessing these events, that we were on the verge of a socialist revolution, or possibly on the verge of one. Uh, and it influenced us very, very much, as did the Vietnam War, the struggle against the Vietnam War, <coughs> the anti-racist struggle in the United States, uh, the civil rights movement both there and in the nascent civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. And, you know, uh, not just that, it, it's interesting after 50 years when you look back and you start to do a little research, just exactly what a time of ferment it was. And I'd like to borrow a word from, uh, I think it's physics, I'm not the scientist by any means, and that's osmosis. I think we were absorbing influences from the atmosphere virtually through our skin and it was coming out in our thinking about what we should do uh, both in regard to the university and society. So essentially we found it, we picked the name quite deliberately. Um, they're Students for Democratic Action with the emphasis on the action. And we did intend right from the get-go uh, to abandon all uh, conciliatory approaches and be very, very direct and very confrontational. And Looking back, I think, yeah, that actually worked. Um, just to give you an example of the atmosphere, uh, some years before, I, I entered college in 1967, and I think around 19... I, I read an article uh, as part of the preparation for all this uh, by Anthony Clare, Dr. Tony Clare, and he wrote an article which had to be published in a Trinity publication in 1962 because no publication in UCD would accept it. And it was about the repressive atmosphere in the college. And one of the things he mentioned in the article uh, was that a couple of years before that, a student had published what was regarded as a risque story in one of the college papers <coughs> and was disciplined for uh, the words he had penned. Uh, the, the Ellen H. decided to take a stand on this matter of free speech, essentially, and pass a resolution uh, condemning the college authorities. The response of the authorities was to cancel the Ellen H. inaugural meeting and uh, ball, or at least ban it from being held in the, the, the inaugural, from being held in the college, and it was held outside of the college. So, a small example of the way in which, uh, you know, the governing body, or more exactly the triumvirate which ran the governing body, saw us. And we decided, right, we've enough of that, we're going to take you uh, and teach you a few lessons. And we spent the summer pretty much planning this, uh, well, not planning exactly, but discussing how we would approach it, and pretty much from... September uh, of that year, once we returned, it kicked off. And I think we're fairly familiar with the events. I'm not going to go back over it. Uh, we can explore those in the course of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, next speaker, Nicole Pepinster, who uh, visits Ireland uh, about once a year. And she, uh, she lives in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, um, but, but English-born, uh, of Belgian background. And uh, she has uh, come over, timed her visit this year to, to, to speak here, and also to attend the event in the, con the National Concert Hall on the 12th of March, the, uh, evening of music and memories called Peace, Love and Protest, which I'm sure you've all already booked tickets for uh, because it's nearly booked out at this stage. So uh, Nicola is going to talk about 
the, the effect of her SDA activities on her and a bit about her subsequent uh, political involvement. Okay, thank you, Declan. So I would have been here even if I hadn't been a panelist um, I, because it was a very important uh, time in my life. Um, I came to UCD in 66. I came from England. Um, I had no Irish connections whatsoever. I barely knew where I was coming, but my family was Belgian. I grew up in London, went to convent school, and one of the nuns suggests that I come to UCD. She had been an English major like me. So I came to UCD in 66. Um, I got involved in Dramsock early on in the first year with Mick Sheridan, uh, Johnny McManus, who was the director of one of the first plays I was in. And so Dramsock was a, an important, um, important experience. We were doing really cutting-edge drama. Um, it was when I think back, it was amazing, the production of Tom Paine, which had been produced a year earlier in New York at La Mama. We were doing it here in Dublin. It was amazing. Um, I really knew nothing about uh, university governments, governance. I had really no idea. Um, uh, for me, I felt privileged to be at university. I was enjoying the freedom it gave me. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize there were problems. Housing was an enormous problem, and I think it still is today. Um, so that certainly was a problem. Um, but then when the SDA was formed, I started going to meetings. Um, I got carried away by the energy, uh, by the occupation, and I really understood that something momentous was happening. Um, I was also aware of events in France. I was aware of the civil rights movements in the United States. I think at that time I was already probably reading uh, Eldridge Cleaver and the Soledad Brothers, so they were an influence on me. And so I got taken up um, by, by the events uh, in the university. But it was really when it, we started going outside the university, when people began, Johnny McManus was one, Dave Grafton was another, who began talking about what was happening outside the university, and when it moved outside, and when we became involved in labor politics, when we supported striking workers. Um, that's when I really became politicized and really got excited. I wanted change. I grew up in London. I was really aware of the class system in England, um, and I understood already a little bit about the inequalities in our, in our society, and I wanted change. So for me, it was very exciting. When 69 happened, I graduated, and I was totally isolated. Ema Sweeney reminded me, my, my good friend Ema Sweeney, who was here, reminded me that she also felt, uh, felt isolated when she moved from Alsford Terrace to, Belf to, to Belfield. So that wasn't an individual experience for, my, for me. But I think I stayed in Ireland. Um, I wanted to, didn't want to go back to London. And so I drifted into left-wing politics and got even more politicized, but uh, got very frustrated with, with uh, extreme left-wing politics. Uh, the revolution wasn't happening. <laughs> but I drifted in and out of different jobs in Dublin and um, finally then uh, decided to go into teaching. And I thought that I could make a difference by teaching. And so I really spent, have spent uh, the majority of my life teaching in different places. Um, I taught in London, I taught in Belfast, and then in the United States. Spent most of my career teaching in the United States. As far as um, political involvement, um, I was um, after Dublin I, when I lived in Belfast. There, I became involved um, with, the, um, with Paddy Devlin, who was trying to, to found a, um, a Labour Party in Northern Ireland. This was in the 1980s. And um, so I was in Belfast from 1982 to 1988. And, um, bleak, bleak time. Uh, yes, it was a difficult time. I was working for Margaret Thatcher's youth training program. Um, which uh, we were all very cynical about, those of us who taught on it. 
um, but um, because we knew it had been instituted to um, keep unemployed youth off the unemployment records. But in Belfast, it did have a certain, a certain uh, positive effect that it kept kids out of the paramilitaries. I felt that was a good thing. Um, and then after that, um, I went back to the States and um, did not become involved in anything else political. I lived in the States uh, for over 30 years before I became a citizen. So political activity would have been difficult. Um, but in, Louis in Louisiana, I be become um, involved in politics there, supporting the few, very few democratic uh, politicians <coughs> that we have in, in, that, in that state. Um, I also, more and more recently, um, with Bernie Sanders. So I'm a big supporter of Bernie Sanders and have been supporting him and will support him again. I mean, it's, it, was ex it was enormously exciting that there was somebody as left-wing as, as him running for president. My other political activity was, um, was relegated to the workplace. So in everywhere I worked, um, in the, I taught in universities, two, different, two very different universities in South Louisiana. And there I was politically active as a student advocate and a faculty advocate, um, and, uh, which often got me into a lot of trouble. But I, I was never conflicted. Um, so for several years, I served as a department chair. I was very aware that that was a middle management position um, but again, there was, for me, there was no conflict. I, I was the faculty representative, representative. And so all this goes back to 69. If that hadn't been the case, I think my life would have been extremely difficult. Uh, and for me, it was always very clear. Decisions where I stood in my, in my work and in my political life have always been very clear since then. So it's thanks to 69. And I'd be happy to ask, answer questions about um, <coughs> universities in the South and of political backwardness. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, Frank McDonald, I suspect, doesn't need any introduction. Um, he's, he's just published his memoir, uh, Truly Frank, a Dublin memoir, published by <laughs> Penguin. <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, should, I should mention that it, it includes a very vivid description of the occupation of Earth for Terrace, uh, which is oh, just two pages, but very, very good, very pithy. Um, and he has, he has a perhaps less romantic achievement in that he was very much involved in setting up the Belfield Bar, for which I was very grateful in, in years to come. But uh, he's became a very radical voice on, on, the, uh, on the issue of Dublin's architecture and building and planning and so on. But tonight he's going to, he's going to focus on his, his UCD uh, radical career. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Um, I, 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 Basil has already referred to the kind of repressive atmosphere that there was in UCD uh, in the in 1960s. <coughs> and, um, and I just wanted to bring that home to the few students of the college who have turned up tonight and to remind everybody else what it was really like. So I'm, I'm reading, uh, the first part of this is just an extract from the book uh, about UCD. There wasn't a crucifix over every blackboard in Earlsford Terrace, but it felt as if there ought to be. Those who ran UCD saw it as a direct line successor of the Catholic University of Ireland, founded by John Henry Cardinal Newman, and they zealously held on to his big house uh, uh, on St. Stephen's Green beside University Church. The Catholicism of UCD was thinly disguised Catholic chaplains were euph euphemistically called deans of residence. Opus Dei and other religious organizations uh, ran halls of residence. Our days off coincided with the Catholic holy days, and nuns in their habits would always take the front row in lecture theaters. 
the metaphysics department was headed by Monsignor John Horgan, a classic Thomist who believed that Heidegger and Kierkegaard should be taught only for the purpose of demonstrating that they were in error. Horgan's understudy was the Reverend Desmond Connell, who had done his doctoral thesis on the insubstantiality of angels. In other words, how many you could fit on the head of a pin, <laughs> etc. Uh, and went on to become uh, a rather poor uh, a Catholic Archbishop uh, of Dublin and Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. UCD was that kind of place 50 years ago. And although it was a constituent college of the National University of Ireland, designated as non-denominational uh, by charter under the 1908 Irish Universities Act, a Catholic church was installed in Belfield in 1968, long before the library of, was built. <laughs> It transpired that the college authorities had got around the restriction uh, in the NUI Charter by dedicating the piece of land on which the church stood to the Archdiocese of Dublin in perpetuity. And as if by magic, it was no longer legally part of the campus at Belfield. We did not take this lying down, of course. The late John Feeney, whose brother is here tonight, uh, leading light of an avowedly Christian socialist group and his cohorts. I think I wasn't a member of that group, but I, I, I definitely was there for the demonstration. We turned up with placards protesting against the consecration of the church by Dublin's legendarily authoritarian Archbishop, John Charles McQuaid. I think it was in May 1968, coinciding with the Les Evénements in Paris. But we were always protesting against something or other uh, and what we saw as abuses at home and abroad, marching to the US Embassy in protest against the Vietnam War, as Basil has mentioned, and through the city centre, raising our voices in solidarity with the homeless. On one such march in January 1969, organised by the Dublin Housing Action Committee, to highlight the dire housing situation in the city, I witnessed Gardaí lining up at the apex of Delir Street and Westmoreland Street, ostentatiously removing their identification tags and then baton charging a crowd of us sitting on O'Connell Bridge on a Saturday afternoon. So when it came to the SDA occupation of the college's administration, I was there. Naturally, it made the lead story in all the morning papers, quote, the black flag of anarchy flew over UCD last night, <laughs> unquote, said the immortal first line of the Irish Independence front page story. But despite our occupation and the week-long mass meetings in the Great Hall, teach-ins, they were called, that attracted up to 5,000 people, students and staff, we failed to halt the move to Belfield. The fact that we're sitting here tonight shows that. Um, and the arts faculty relocated there very reluctantly in autumn 1969 to what was still in parts a very mucky uh, building site. The Academic Council of the college set up a committee of inquiry into the recent disturbances in the college. All of those, letter, all of those words are capped. Uh, have caps uh, start letters, uh, with the nutty history professor Robin Dudley Edwards uh, as its sole member. <laughs> he turned up every day to take his place in the council chamber wearing baggy chinos, a light summer jacket and a thin psychedelic tie, probably because he was trying to pretend that he was on our side. And after conducting his inquiry, Dudley Edwards wrote an infamous report blaming us for everything and suggesting we should be disciplined for our, role, our roles in the disturbances. None of us were, as far as I can remember. In truth, of course, the relocation of UCD from Earlsford Terrace to Belfield was really like a juggernaut in motion. 
ever since the college bought Belfield House in the 1930s when Michael Tierney was its president. As I noted in my first book, The Destruction of Dublin, back in 1985 when I was still an angry young man, uh, Tierney's move was backed by John Charles McQuaid because it tied in very neatly with his own plans to transfer St. Vincent's, the state's largest Catholic teaching hospital, from St. Stephen's Green to Elm Park on Merrion Road. And thus, as I noted in the book, a great Catholic axis would be created in the suburbs to counterbalance the pernicious orbit of Trinity College and the Protestant teaching hospitals in the city centre. The tragedy for UCD, or for Dublin rather, is that UCD could have, could have expanded in and around Earlsford Terrace had it chosen to do so on numerous sites that subsequently came up for redevelopment, including Alexandra College, the Sacred Heart Convent on Leeson Street, and much of the south and east sides of St. Stephen's Green. And you could even extend it all the way back along Charlemagne Street towards uh, the canal. And I think that would have been a prize that was worth fighting for. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. And uh, just, uh, it's great to be reminded of all those uh, dramatic days. And I recall that uh, there were actually four SDA people who took part in the famous Belfast to Derry march, uh, which was uh, attacked at Burn Tollet. Uh, two of them are here tonight, Basil and Una Claffey. And uh, of course, John Cahill was another participant who was uh, quite badly injured in, the, in, in that <coughs> event. And the late Owen Sweeney, who, who passed away uh, not very long ago. Um, there were also huge demonstrations on housing. And I remember a sit-in at the Department of Justice on Stevens Green uh, over the imprisonment of Dennis Dennehy, who was a, a squatter uh, protesting over homelessness. And of course, the whole thing the original, I suppose, big demo was when King Baudouin and Queen Fabiola came to visit Trinity College and uh, followers of a certain chairman from China uh, <laughs> put up a poster, a banner saying Lumumba, who was the Prime Minister of, of the Congo, the former Belgian Congo, uh, Lumumba was killed by Belgian imperialism and uh, the Garda Siakona stepped up to the plate and, and ad administered uh, strict uh, discipline on these, these uh, followers of Chairman Mao, which led to a protest march from UCD to, to Trinity. Um, I suppose not the kind of ecumenism that John Charles would have approved of. <laughs> uh, our, 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 our next speaker is, uh, we're very pleased to have her here. Uh, she has, uh, Young as she is, she's already ha had a, a distinguished career as a speaker, uh, and uh, she also she's, uh, I think, in the tr in the same radical tradition that we we like to think we still belong to, uh, and uh, so Amy Crean, please give her a warm welcome. Feeding back and um, seeing kind of what's the difference between generations and what has changed. It's, um, I think, more striking to me what hasn't and just how much of how many elements in each of those speeches felt incredibly familiar, um, both in the types of actions taken and over which issues, whether it's marching the same places, protesting over housing, treatment of students. Um, and I think that students today and young activists today are facing a lot of the same struggles, which is it's positive to hear people um, speak who've partaken in those and seen positive action to come of it. It's also incredibly defeating and frustrating in some ways to think how many times are we going to come up against these issues. And I think also the sense that you are living in a time when revolution is coming. Um, I think our generation very much feels that. And I'm wondering how much of that extends to each generation when you're young and you're analysing the political system and you're ready to take it apart and make it perfect again or whatever. Um, but I, I do think there is a sense right now amongst young people that 
change has to be coming. And I think we are trying our best to capitalise on that momentum. Um, but so many of the issues, whether it's housing and cost of education even, and barriers within that. So I think the repressive state that UCD was in then wouldn't be recognisable to us now because it's not primarily Catholicism that's driving issues that students face or control them, but I do think it's capitalism and treating them exclusively as customers and that that's posing so many barriers to who gets to do well in their degree or finish their degree or access it in the first place. Um, and I think the same passion for change is here, um, but we are also living in a strange time where we both get to feel endlessly empowered because we've access to so much information to show us how do we change things, who is it that we're fighting and for what reasons, what are their motivations, but also all of that information is so overwhelming, we're faced with it every day. When you say you were inspired or felt motivated by events, say in France, I think similar things are happening right now where because of the speed of technology and media, we've at, we can see what's happening globally and there's so much happening in so many different regions that I think that's pushing us as well. We want to feel part of this big movement that it's not just local or even national. It's this international <laughs> push for the socialist revolution. But I also think that you're looking and seeing that in every region there's something to fight against and it can feel just so defeating at times and you're wondering what can you do when it's this big, what steps can you take? So I think the main thing that I'd like to return to is when you were coming up with your name and you called yourselves Students for a Democratic Action and that's what you wanted to emphasise, that I think that's an emphasis that needs to come back into youth politics today because I think it can be very <coughs> tempting when seeing all of the information that we can access and all of the conversations we can have with so many people so easily to just get caught up and think that's change in itself that just thinking about this, just criticising it, that that's enough to put things in motion. And it, it's not, it's understanding, and it's coming up with an approach, but it's not the solution, because it's not talking to who we need to talk to, and it's not demonstrating to them that we're actually going to do something tangible if action on their part isn't taken. And I think that it's, it's conversations like this and events like these that are going to bring attention to that, because right now I, I think the, the energy is kind of there, but Overall, I would say we could feel at times in a bit of a rush where we're wondering what, what route do we take and how does it play out. So I think it's less about feeling that right now, in this age, this is the biggest revolution ever to happen and be like, okay, there have been several times before where people have, have felt that and have had some success and we need to look back and see how that was achieved if we're to achieve anything similar and go further. Well done. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very struck from listening to you, you know, that although there have been an awful lot of changes in, in our society, I mean, we, when, we, when the SDA started out, you know, uh, say contraception was illegal, abortion wasn't even thought about, uh, divorce was, it was illegal, um, uh, your... Everything, uh, books that contained, yeah. you know, fairly harmless uh, statements or scenarios were banned just uh, by the new time, as we used to say down the country. Uh, but at the same time, as, uh, even though all that has changed, we're, we're much more liberal and secular society, there's still a lot of uh, injustice, inequality and unfairness. And I'd like to ask if any member of the pa uh, the 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 three SDA members of the panel like to respond to what to Amy's point. Um, I was just I was just going to say as an outsider, of course, the change in Ireland has been tremendous, but it's social and cultural change. But it's still the problem. The basis is still that there hasn't been economic change, and that's the problem. And um, so you were talking about um, access to education, access to higher education, which is something that I've been very involved in um, as in, in the university and also as a writer, I've written about access to universities. And, uh, and so th this is the basic problem because there have been so many studies done that if you don't have access to higher education in the United States, your chances of ever getting it moving into the middle class is absolutely, it's, it's, it's just, it doesn't happen. 
Um, and so that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge problem. And in fact, in, in the States, we've gone backwards um, in, in access to education. Um, there, was, there was, you know, because of the civil rights movement, um, because of the GI Bill in the 1970s, um, and in the late 60s and the 70s, the, the universities opened up. And, um, and there was an awful lot of money spent um, on really good programs to make, um, you know, children of, of, of the working class, of, of so-called so minorities, African Americans, to make university accessible for, that, for them. But that all fell apart in the 80s. And so we've actually gone backwards um, in, in terms of accessibility to university. And that's what Bernie Sanders is talking about. In a sense, he's talking about free education for higher education. And I would think also it would be really important to have free education for community colleges. I worked at one time in community colleges, and this was really a way to provide access to higher education. I'm sorry if I've gone off the topic a little bit, but I think that's, that's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm ignorant and I don't know what the situation you, is you, in, in you Ireland. You, you've the worked in an African-American university, is that right? Well, yeah, I spent the last 18 years um, working in a historically black university, which was also Catholic. <laughs> and also very, is actually quite repressive for faculty. Um, of course, we have academic freedom, um, but I was amused when I was watching um, one of the videos that you sent. Oh, yeah. And I was watching a, a faculty member from UCD in 69 talking about the fact that only 20% of the, of the institution, of the, of the community, were the decision makers um, in, the, in the Catholic Black University, where I worked, we had one person making the decision. That was the president. So it was. It was. Um, we had a lot of struggles. We had the faculty had a lot of struggles to democratize the university. I was very interested, Frank, in what you were saying there about the potential for UCD to expand beyond Earth for Terrace yeah. in the neighborhood around. I remember Alexandra College, for example. And uh, I, I have, I've often wondered, was there uh, an agenda there in terms of, say, John Charles McQuaid and uh, Professor Tierney, who had been a very conservative head of the college, uh, to, to, to take the students away from the immoral influence of, of the city centre? That's, that's what it was, you know. Yeah. That's what it was. Seriously, it was. No, 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 no. That is what it... That, that, Perfect nonsense. No. It is not nonsense, it is the truth. And also, and also, if I could expand on it a bit, um, it was also uh, very much the thinking of the time, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, that universities needed to be, to have suburban campuses um, and needed to get out of tight inner city situations. But there is no doubt that uh, there was a religious aspect to it. Uh, that was the view that was shared by McQuaid and by Tierney, uh, and later by J.J. Hogan, who actually was the president of UCD at the time when the move to Belfield uh, happened. Um, I just uh, wanted to make a point about, just talking about what you were talking about earlier on. Um, I did a podcast today with uh, Rory Hearn for the Reboot Republic, uh, whatever you call it, website or podcast site or whatever and it was on the issue of housing in Dublin and I recalled taking part in protests when I was a student and I am still doing that even though like probably the vast majority of people with grey hair here uh, we are sitting on assets um, which are worth considerable sums of money we can be smug and complacent about that as many of us are or we can do something about it and I've taken part myself and encouraged friends to do that too, both young and old, uh, in the various demonstrations that have been taking place in Dublin over the last few months um, in relation to the, uh, organised by the Housing and Homelessness Coalition. Um, and I think there is no room for smugness in the face of the housing emergency that we face in this city at the moment. And I recalled in the podcast 
that I, at the age of 25, which was only four years or f after I got out of UCD, um, uh, I was able to buy my first house on a relatively modest salary, uh, working for the Irish press at the time. And it wasn't just a little two-room cottage or anything like that. It was a four-bedroom end of terrace Edwardian house in Harold's Cross. Nobody of that age in <laughs> Dublin now could do anything like that unless they were a high-paid executive of Google or Facebook. This, you can call me Mr. Dunn, because uh, in, this, in this book, uh, which is the, the history... Oh, right, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yeah. the, the history of uh, the LMH uh, from 1955 to 2005 by Frank Allman. Uh, I, get, I get a little paragraph in this. So, but I, I'm Mr. Dunn, you know, I'm sort of a bit like uh, this myself. We go to uh, Ulysses and the guy who turns up at the uh, Paddy Dignam's funeral, uh, Mr. McIntosh. You know? <laughs> so I'm Mr. Dunn. I suppose I'm lucky I wasn't Mr. Donkey Jacket or Mr. Duffelcoat or Trenchcoat, you know, in those days. Um, I was sort of very much in the periphery of SDA as such, as an 18 year old. Uh, so I wasn't involved in any pre planning. Um, I was repeating the year in 1968. Uh, Morris Sweeney, who's also uh, went to the same school as me in Marion College, which I believe was probably set up by McQuaid, uh, as opposed to Sandman High School, where Basil went to. Mm -hmm. and I think the same thing happened with the Theresian School, which was set up beside the uh, German School, you know, St. Killian's, because my sister went to St. Killian's. Uh, Catholics were allowed to go, and uh, obviously McQuaid didn't want that. But anyway, I, I, if, if, I, I'll just sit and just, uh, just to set the record straight about Mr. Dunn, if you don't mind, if you bear with me. Uh, it, it's quite a good book, this, actually. It's, uh, it's got a very <coughs> interesting reminiscence by uh, Miles Nagopoli talking about going to the LNH, taking out a speech. It's like, uh, coming with a prepared speech, it's like taking a bee sting out, you know, a bee, a bee taking out a bee sting. And then also, uh, Maeve Vinci. Uh, describe the get to Mr. Dunn. Get to, well, get to okay, Mr. Dunn. Yeah, but she called it the sex of the 50s, you know, and the idea of her running, running home all the way to Western Road from the physics. Uh, anyway, it's coming to Mr. Dunn, yes. But I think, yeah, I was on the periphery of this, and uh, myself and Dagon, we set up a group. I think there was a third person in it. Uh, it's called Students for a Workers' Republic. <laughs> and, uh, I remember we. Uh, it was, it was, uh, I got a master class in uh, language and composition from Dagadun, and this pamphlet, this page we prepared, distributed at the LMH meeting. And then a few weeks later, I think it was around the midterm break, I think it was one of Gareth Fitzgerald's nieces wrote to us from Italy or something, and she wanted one of the authors, it had to be one of the authors of this pamphlet, to come and speak. Uh, at the LNH, so uh, Daglin sent me, um, and uh, it's, it, 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 the, the piece that comes from his natural resting place, which was written 1968 to 70 by William Early, who became the senior partner in McCann Fitzgerald, and I think a district judge as well. And uh, it kind of does mention, which I, I thought really the real revolutionary part was that Dennis Denny. I was very involved. In 1968, that summer, I became involved in the Housing Action Committee. Uh, I got to know uh, a lot of these, the Maoists, who were really considered bad news in UCD. We're going to have to cut you short okay, now. Okay, anyway. So it mentions about Dublin Housing Action. But anyway, uh, the 14th meeting of the session was remarkable for two things. First, the society was yet again invaded during private business by an outside agency, members for students for Workers' Republic. The audience allowed their representative, a Mr. Dunn, to address the House for about 10 minutes. His inability to hold his audience, uh, I haven't changed much. by the use of expressions such as bourgeois institution and infantile schoolboy debate, and by his stated failure to see dynamic dialogue or any involvement in the society's discussion of the issues of the day. Kenny's minutes, these would be by Paul Kenny, Pat Kenny's brother, 
of the evening, sought to explain with the aid of a quote from Chekhov the curious obsession of the SWR with an institution which they considered relevant. He was a rationalist, but he had to confess that he liked the ringing of church bells. <laughs> and then further on, so ended an eventful year, or rather a year of Venemont, the society, although not per se involved in the genital revolution, contributed, has hey, Mr. Dunn, in its debates and through the involvement of its members in other forums to the dynamic dialogue that in some way changed the relationship between staff and students. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I know Una Klaffey wants to respond to Amy's contribution. And we'll take, we'll take you then, okay? Yeah, and just to the points that you were making, Amy, about the constitution of the universities, by constitution, I mean really the composition of the universities. Uh, in the 60s, 2% of the student body in UCD came from working class backgrounds. Um, I know it very well because I was one of them. Uh, and on one of our uh, braver adventures, when we went in to confront the editorial board of independent newspapers because of the articles they'd written about the Trinity students that um, I think it was Frank referred to, Maus, uh, that there was a, a good deal of concern in my home because my father was an employee of independent newspapers. He was a printer. And uh, he was literally terrified of losing his job. But anyway, it didn't come to that. But obviously, that has changed enormously in terms of the students today. I mean, clearly, in our day, there, was, um, there were the constituent colleges at the NUI, UCD, UCG, and UCC. And there weren't the, you know, the other third level colleges that there are yeah, today. So I think in terms of the, the, the class access to education today, and it goes back to what you were saying also about the states, the class um, composition of the universities and the student body today is much wider than it was in our day. Um, and, you know, UCD was a very middle class institution, as well as, you know, all the other things. And, and I remember somebody saying to me, I mean, students obviously didn't have cars in those days. They barely had bikes. Yes, yeah, the American right. students had bikes, but the other <laughs> students But um, somebody had, had got the loan of his father's car for a meeting at the History Society and gave me a lift home. And uh, a fellow student the next day from a very well known Virginia family, which I remain nameless, said to me, um, Oh, so and so was giving you a lift home last night. And I said, Yeah, that's right. Uh, telling us about the funny little house you live in. And I said, actually, uh, that's nothing funny about it at all, several hundred uh, identical to it on the same working class estate in Drimna. But that was, that was what it was like. Um, and, and we tend to forget that. And, and I really do want to say, and I'm not being patronizing when I say this, I think what we saw from students in this country in the last couple of years both in the marriage equality referendum yeah. and as somebody who sponsored the anti-amendment campaign in 83 uh, in the repeal the eighth campaign. I mean, it, it's really, you know, it's very encouraging to see the engagement of here, so here. many students. Here, 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 here. books around me all, all day, every day, I never had a We did have great fun, and there was also, maybe it was naive, but there was a great sense of optimism. There was a great sense that we were going to change the world, and we could change the world. Um, and unfortunately, few of us would have that view, I think, now in the sense of how we envisaged, envisaged it then. But um, I just want to say it's, it's, it's great to, I was never in Belfield, thank God, but um, I was the last class to graduate out of the terrace, and I would have been dead without Kerwin House and O'Dwyer's and Hart. Here, and here too. <laughs> but it is great to be back here, and it's great to see so many people. And there's one person here tonight, because we all talk about how we all went out of the university and you know, supported the Dublin Housing Action Committee and went on demos, and I did, with everybody else. But Maureen de Borca is here tonight. Oh, um, brilliant. And Maureen de Borca got a PhD from this university, an honorary doctorate. 
and it's probably one of the few good things the university has done in the last few years. So uh, I met her on the way in, but I don't know where she's sitting, and I don't expect her to stand up or anything daft like that. <laughs> but she's here, and she. I think here, here. Here. Yeah. Yes, uh, Maureen or, or Donald? Somebody else wants to Donald, I think Donald Brokaw wanted, wanted to respond Frank, to Frank. Which a dissenting voice is very important. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, Donald Brokaw. Yeah, I, I think. I too was going to invest the aim of this gentleman here, reminded me, he said, all oh, we were was an elected bunch of agitators. And that's correct. That's True what enough. we were. Yeah. I just want to say Nothing that wrong with that. A lot of emphasis goes on SDA when you listen to do. radio programs and all that on the Labour Party, there were actually four strands in SDA. One was John Feeney, that John Feeney-led group that has already been referred to, kind of Christian Marxist grill. The other was Dransop, which Nicole referred to. And then there were a couple of, um, let's say, call them free spirits, uh, like Kevin Myers and myself and Paul Graham and a, a number of other guys who uh, were um, active. I just want to reflect back. I'm not interested in discussing whether UCD could have stayed in Earth or Terrace or not. That's ancient history. And what I'm more interested in is looking forward. And I just want to think back, if you think, in the 50 years since 69, we have only re-elected an outgoing government once. And that was in 202, when we re-elected what was the worst government that this state has ever had because it could have stopped the healthy craziness. I just want to think, in terms of what Amy is, what kind of a state have we allowed to be constructed in this, this country? Those of us who were uh, in UCD then, and remember, we were only 5% of the relevant age group. We were only 5% of the relevant age group. Now it's, I think, it's over 40, 45% go on to third level uh, education. Uh, but what kind of a state have we allowed to be constructed that the state can can stop recruiting to the only police force it has for five years. And if the purpose of the state is not to keep law and order, what is the purpose of the state? And if the purpose of the state is to keep law and order, how can it stop recruiting policemen for five years and then accelerate the recruitment a couple of years later so that in 30, 25, 30 years time, You'll have the same problem of a whole lot of people retiring and no replacements. The second thing that has happened in this state is that we have allowed a two-tier civil service to be created, a two-tier public service to be created. And that happened under both Labour governments, Fianna Gael governments and Fianna Fáil governments. Now, why have we allowed that to happen? And what kind of things can we do to, to change that? Uh, and I think one of the things we can do is we can follow the lead of the uh, Constitutional Convention and the Citizens' Assembly. The only topic that they considered, both, both considered, the only topic both considered was modern direct democracy. And they voted, both assemblies voted by, in favor of that by more than voted for same-sex marriage and uh, for the repeal of the eighth. Um, when the state was founded in the 1920s, <laughs> direct democracy was part of the state. It was part of the free state constitution that was taken out. I think if we're going to face the kind of things that Amy has put her finger on, and not worry about all the sex stuff. We didn't start out housing because we didn't implement things like the Kenny Report. And Kenny was a UCD, <laughs> was a UCD academic who had taken the college to task some years previously. Uh, and, uh, but, so we didn't sort out basic issues of, of the state, how the state functions, and how, what we now need to do to, to change that. Uh, I'm suggesting the only mechanism we have, because every other method has failed. I'll give you one example. Um, two members of SDA were in power in the late, seven, the late 90s. Rory Quinn was Minister for Finance, and Edna uh, Fitzgerald was Junior Minister. They brought in Freedom of Information, and a very radical, reasonably grounded Freedom of Information Act it was too. 
That was changed after the 202 election, as far as I can make out, at the behest of uh, senior civil servants. It wasn't an, an issue in the election. When the uh, Fine Gael uh, Labour government came in, they put it into their program for government in 2011 that they would restore the 1997 Act. They did not restore it uh, at all. Now, I'm saying that we have been let down by our, what I call our state class. In other words, the people who get invited to state receptions. But when citizens were given the option, and it wasn't on the agenda of the Constitutional Convention, but when they came up with the idea of modern direct democracy, I think it's the kind of thing we need for checks and balances to limit the scope of the powerful, whether they're public or private, elected or appointed. Thank you. It's, it's, it's great to see Maureen de Burke here. Uh, I have uh, great memories of her. Uh, I, I was the SDA delegate to the Dublin Housing Action Committee. Uh, but I didn't put that on my CV when I was applying for a job later for some reason. Uh, also, thank you, Eamon, for your memories of the SWR. I think the, some smart right-wing Fine Gael smart aleck in the LNH uh, shortened it to sewer. <laughs> uh, so um, we're, we're having a, an interesting, interesting exchange of views here. Uh, anyone else now want to get the spoke in? James Monaghan, I had a feeling that you would. Thank you. Uh, my memory of uh, SDA was uh, how did people like Basil and company get up and talk to complete strangers. Where did they get the courage from? And I remember my first meeting, uh, gabbling something and running away and expecting to hear not applause but laughter. But uh, things have changed slightly. But uh, things have changed and things haven't changed. And what hasn't been mentioned is, at least back in those days, we had a Conor Cruz O'Brien who could write to Katanga and back and mention the murder of the Mumba, who, which has been mentioned earlier. And now we have thousands of American troops going through Shannon on a daily basis, off to murder, kill, etc. And not even a debate. We have American, we have <coughs> Irish troops based in the bull. Why? Was there a debate in the Dáil? No. Uh, we're joining NATO by the back door. We have PESCO in the, United, in the EU, which is a military arm of the EU. Now, I am opposed to Brexit and an Irish exit, but I don't want the EU to turn into the uh, civilian wing of NATO, and we have that. So we think things have changed. Uh, when I went to college, there might have been boring jobs in the civil service, but they were safe. There might have been boring jobs in insurance companies, but they were safe. But there's plenty of people now in great jobs, and they don't know if on Friday the email will come in from somewhere saying that they're gone. Uh, the, the term they use is precarity, and it sounds like a nice social uh, science type word, but uh, it's a thing. And people talk about violence, etc. And I remember reading uh, last week in the Irish Times, which of course I read because that can work with the work of the Irish Times, <laughs> but the number of suicides went up dramatically during the recession. Yeah. And people say that things have improved. They've improved in some ways, in other ways they've got worse. And what I would say is what the world needs is a major, tougher, bigger and more extensive and with one that cannot be forced to retreat. Uh, the speaker up the back there, if you just wait a minute, make him bring up the, the mic. Would you introduce yourself please? My name is Paul Leach. I, 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 Paul Leach, you remember the name all right? Hallowed Hall, rather a middle of the road university in my opinion, and still is. But, but the point that Frank touched on, which I think is rather critical, is, I don't want to shout into this, can you hear me? Is, is that this room is full of empowered people. With the bus pass comes extraordinary freedom. Freedom years are very powerful. Political parties know that we vote and that we think and that we are resourced. So uh, I would like to draw attention following Amy's remarks to the fantastic worldwide movement at the moment, uh, set off by Greta Thunberg, a kid of 15, now 16, 
who although she suffers from OCD and so on, she's a savant about the situation we're in. I spent the day drawing a naked man, uh, it's usually a naked woman, in an art studio. And the reason I mention it is beside me is an environmentalist, a very polite woman, as Aidan Dunn referred to Mary Swansea recently, a rather prim woman. And she has just been to the Galapagos and to Antarctica on serious scientific missions. And she said in a word, and she shocked us all at lunch, we're fucked. You can say what you like, but we're addicted to growth, consumption, regular capitalism. And this university has got a distinguished uh, tradition of analysis and the kind of what the French call décroissance, uh, an economy that is not coupled to growth, uh, an image of a society and an economy that is based on fitness. We all know from our own physiques this time of life, you're constantly struggling against growth. The, the aim and objective is a fit society, which functions well, has a good metabolism, yada yada, I need another half an hour, so I'll shut up with this, that I would urge this group not to uh, spend too long in nostalgia, but as I am doing, focus on my grandchildren who are six and two and one is about to be born. And I refuse to accept my neighbor's outburst today, although she was intellectually correct. If you extrapolate what's happening, yeah. she is correct. And it's up to us as we pass the torch and the microphone, and I will now, to do something for them before they're 15 and 16. And two weeks from tomorrow, worldwide, 15 and 16 year olds are going to be at government buildings, including ours. Please support them. Hear, hear. I'll go later. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, Amy. Um, if I could just feed back on a couple of the points there. I think that it's absolutely true that the people in this room hold a lot of power and that's something that would be really valuable to us when we are trying to identify and fight against certain issues to be recognised and to be listened to because I think there are so many issues in how we see our own problems very much as of our own time, we frame them in language of our own time, we compare them to things happening elsewhere but of this time and I don't think we're trying to build those links and I also feel that it can cause this barrier. So it's, it's like was mentioned about cl class in UCD and it's things have absolutely improved and when we discuss accessibility it's not that we're trying to diminish that and I didn't mean to overlook the massive changes that have been achieved but for example in UCD we have the highest repeat fees in the country and for people who have to work part-time jobs we're told by professors not to do that as if it's an option for some people. It, it's not. And I, but I do think it's frustrating when we express things without giving full context that we sound ungrateful for the massive changes that you fought to achieve and that's not the case. But I do think it causes this double frustration where you have put so much work into creating a more progressive culture that's more accepting of so many things. But what we've got is legal equality in many ways. We have a framework that entitles us to move forward regardless of gender, sexual orientation, race, class. But that's almost a technicality because there's still that power being concentrated that still has all those same barriers in some ways but they've manifested differently. Like the Me Too movement now that's trying to work for feminism or whatever it is, it's so easy for people to push back and say, oh, look at the milestones, the civil rights movement in America, the suffragettes movement for the vote. It's, we're not trying to diminish those things, but culturally there's so much to push back against. Ireland has the single biggest AIDS crisis in Europe and I think possibly globally right now. I mean, that's despicable. But we got marriage equality and we were the only country, the first country to do so by popular vote. And that was such an achievement that when we try to raise issues around homophobia and orientation, it sounds like we're, we're putting that down. That was massive, but that did, that's still an issue when it comes into AIDS and that should have been solved so long ago as it was for other countries because the medicine is available. As was mentioned about wars, violence that's occurring, our, our treatment of asylum seekers and our deportation centres, there are things we need to fight against, but in order to do so, 
I think we need to look at previous contexts and be wary of how we present our own. So we are both acknowledging where we've come from and reframing that it's not just homophobia is at its worst right now or sexism, but that culturally we're trying to fight a specific aspect. But I would also say that when we identify those things, we're not blind to our own privileges that have led us here or that we've come very far but we do require support and patience in going forward because there is still work to be done sometimes even when on the surface level or the framework seem to be established for us to be doing so much better like we have we have much higher ed uh, third level education rates right now but the job opportunities don't reflect it the salaries certainly don't because economically they're not growing at the same rate of housing costs so some of our issues might fall under the same categories but present entirely differently and it's why I think when communicating about these I, I would ask to hear us out that when we are pushing against them it's not that we're not recognizing that work is done it's that there are other aspects to it that we would still like to develop and appreciate <coughs> advice and support on because again you are the voting part people and people recognize that and respond to that and people don't really treat and listen to young people, and particularly students, in the same way. I think marriage quality and repeal change that to an extent. We try to flex that it's like when we have a clear avenue, we'll take it. But outside of that, and just intellectual spheres and trying to push any authority, there's a lot of pushback against us where I think there's opportunity for forming community around it and trying to create links instead of setting up groups separately. Thank you. Um, Dig on. <laughs> Uh, Noel County uh, was here from 65 until just after 70 because I did pre-med first of all and then went into arts. So I was actually floating around between this block which was used for uh, science, moved out here in 1965, the pre-med group moved out. And in the comment about the sisters there, the only group that would actually were told to come in in ordinary clothes were the Reverend Sisters in our class in 65. And apparently there have been a few stories about lay, lay gentlemen from the country going out and asking one of, the, one of these sisters out for a night out. And of course, she said, I'll meet you outside the convent. <laughs> Not realizing that she was a reverend sister. But 65 <laughs> was quiet. I mean, moving into 67, really, what, what, um, I, was, uh, I wasn't part of any of the movements, but I was very interested in seeing what was going on. I kept a very close eye on it. And lived and did France a lot of my summers. In 68, uh, that summer, I remember standing at the bottom of Bourg Saint Michel and being moved on because I dared to speak to a French person um, there because no more than one person was allowed to congregate at the bottom of the Bourg Saint Michel. It was three months after the events of May of that year. So um, in UCD itself at that time, the famous because we were talking, it was, we heard it on John Bowman's program during the week, the plank that was stretched from the the, the, the room which was used by the administration block out onto the wall outside. There is a, uh, those of you who know the National Concert Hall, of would know there's a, a sort of a pit between the, the outer wall and the actual wall of the building itself. So the plank was the only way for people to get in and get out. And people were coming in and going out there at night. I remember being there when there was a, one particular uh, mother um, who showed me a nameless uh, was there and she was begging Professor Murphy to go in on the plank and bring out her darling son, who was letting the family down by being inside there in the first place. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. But it was, you know, it was a very strange scene. And then another person who was involved in um, the man called Tim Gleason. Is that the right, that name right? Tim was there, and Tim was in the post office, and as far as I can remember. Pardon? He was in the post office official. That's right, yes. So I think that he was involved in the drama with the post offices years before that when they were looking for more than 10p an hour for their, for their work as an admin. But he was a good guy in that plank every night anyhow. But it was very funny to see, think of, it only lasted a short while. But I don't think we were, you know, we were organised as much as, say, in Paris. I mean, Daniel Colbendit, who became, um, he, was, he was the, the person that my mother most worried about, in case I might run, he might take me away. Uh, that's the Irish were told about Danny the Rouge and his thought. And apparently the, the myth in the papers and the Irish papers showed him up as being a real dangerous person that would run away with uh, the poor unfortunate young Irish kid of, of, of uh, 20 years of age who was willing to look after himself. Uh, but I mean, look at how he has developed over the years becoming, he's a great thorn in everyone's side, speaking French and German. Um, as he became a member of the European Parliament. 
But lots of things happened in those in those years that were interesting. But I think that today, move on forward to today, I was on the O'Connor Bridge, moved off the street with a guard the RT televised and all that in the, in the housing action business. But I sat down on the Cotton Bridge, I think for the fun of it all, to see what would happen. <laughs> but nowadays, I have seen over the last few years, university students from UCD asking for permission from the authorities to have a march into O'Connor Street. And the, the authority said, you can't do that, you're going in. And the students said, okay, we were told, we won't go in. Yeah. So a lot, whereas the Gilets jaunes, uh, Gilets jaunes in France, for instance, that movement would not have become as big as it became if people hadn't said, we're not asking the police for permission to walk from A to B. We're just going to do it, that's the end of it. Yeah. So every week, as you, as you watch it over 15, 16 yeah. weeks, yeah. there was a full report on French television. You could see the numbers of marches which had been authorized and the ones which hadn't been authorized. And which was a problem for the authorities, because only about three of them were authorized and 10 more were not authorized. So this business of asking permission before you go marching it's kind of weird, because it didn't happen in our day. People just went and marched, that was the end of the evening, the local superintendent. You, you, you weren't actually selling raffle tickets. I mean, that's what the raffle ticket, uh, you had to ask permission to sell a raffle ticket. But if you do a march, it's something different. Anyway, that's just a few little, few little anecdotes that might contribute and might recall memory from people. I think we had the advantage in Arts for Terrace, being in the arts block, whereas a lot of people from science and engineering uh, were in other blocks of the university who wouldn't know the terrace as well as we got to know it. Thank you. Thank you. Your good self. Uh, introduce yourself, please. Hello, Leo Mangum. I think we also have to recognise the progress that has been made. Back in 1969, the university authorities would not even allow a student representative council. They did not want such a thing to taint. Eventually, no, a student, student union government. you're talking about, a so student sorry. union. They, no, there was an SRC already. There was an SRC and then I, the student union was finally formed. I was, I, I acted as solicitor for the student union for 40 years until I retired four years ago. But the progress that has been made, that it's an organized student union. There are full-time paid student officers between president and welfare officer, education officer, even entertainment officer. So progress has been made and another simple example of the progress that has been made is we're sitting in the student's union building, which the student's union control. It wasn't, didn't have to be organized from a flat in rat's mines or over pants or whatever. So, there is a lot of progress being made, and on the other hand, sometimes maybe there isn't as much direct anger in relation to the outside world as I might think. But a considerable uh, progress has been made, and namely it provides a base upon which student activity can work from, rather than skittering around. So, onwards and upwards. Deglon. Deglon, Deglon. Can I say Frank, something? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, what we're actually sitting in is an extension to the Student Union building that was built about uh, less than 20 years ago. And uh, as, this is, this is a, a further development of it, um, in fact. And I'm just reminded, I mean, reference was made to the Belfield Bar, the first bar in Belfield, which I'm glad to say Kieran Fahey is here as well. And Kieran and myself were involved in, in, in setting that up in 1971. And just to show you how things have improved. I was involved with yeah, the there. It was, it was a terrapin building. It was all we could afford. We had managed to persuade uh, Joe McHale, JP McHale, the secretary and bursar of UCD, who ran UCD out of his head in the pre-computer days. He knew everything that was going on. He initially wasn't going to let us have a student bar, but we insisted on it and managed to raise much of the money to build it ourselves. And when it finally opened in August 1971, I can tell you that we set the prices at the same level as Dublin bar prices at the time. A pint of Guinness was 17 pence. A pint of Smithix was 18 pence, and a pint of Harp was 21. And that was about the size of it, because McHale wouldn't let us serve spirits at the outset. He thought that the spirits would have the same effect on students 
as uh, they had on, on, on what were known uh, in the bad old days as Red Indians in the United States. <laughs> Fire water. Yeah. Uh, John McGuire, who has, uh, by the way, has uh, written a very, who wrote a very good account of the General Revolution in, in this book called The General Revolution, of Crisis the in the Universities, edited by Philip Pettit, uh, published, I think, in 1970, was it? Yeah. John, John later became a very distinguished professor at UCC, but he reached the height of his, his, his existence tonight when he acted as an usher for the people who were attending this event. <laughs> Rika and myself, we ush very well. Um, <laughs> so my, my involvement was uh, really having been addicted to the LLA for over four and a half years. That's how I drifted into chairing some of the mass meetings and enjoyed that. Found the point where dialogue stopped, but I mean trying to enable dialogue. And I think we run up against walls, we run up against different um, interests, different forces, and there we are. Um, the note that has been struck most resonantly for me is Jim Monaghan talking about Shannon. Um, that's been, in a way, the single issue for me over the last 20 years. There's a, a vigil every second Sunday, second Sunday of every month in Shannon. Bus passes can be used for that as well. Um, and there have been many people braver than I who've gone in, cut the wire, and, and got involved in that kind of way. And um, we have a new uh, booklet coming out on, on Tesco, spelling out a lot of what Jim was talking about there, uh, coming out in the next week or so with a number of TDs are sponsoring it. Uh, just a couple of thoughts on it. Over 3 million troop movements through Shannon. It's clear from the Shocking. that when the US, after the pit stop plowshares disabled a plane, the US wanted to stop coming to Shannon, and the Irish government asked them not to. So the notion that uh, you know, we, we would lose all our industry is crazy. Uh, in fact, the government, uh, they could have let it go. The US was ready to let it go. But the government want just as much to be in the money, they want to be up there with the big boys. I think that's absolutely central, the, the psychological, cultural politics of it. Is it a single issue? No. Tom Clonan's memoir, very interesting, Soldier, Whistleblower, something else, he actually says the penny dropped for him with the Gulf War when he realized that business and war are seamlessly integrated. And we are seamlessly integrated, and we just start looking at that. We're now planning under PESCO to get involved. We are involved in, in the European Defense Agency. We are seeing the basis of science and research as the preparation for war. So we're, we face something very, very deep there. Uh, in a period, I should know the year period, I think it's the last decade or so, but in the, 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 the um, a children's charity recently came out with solid figures that during a period where 175,000 soldiers had died in war, half a million children had died in war. And that's not the children killed by sanctions, that's children killed in war. And we're silently, blindly, weirdly ignoring that. Time after time, over three million troop movements. And the final point on this in PESCO, anyone who wants to address housing, health, or education, just watch the budget go up in PESCO. The NATO target is 2% of GDP, GNP. That would bring us from under a billion to well over three billion. We may not do that, but the pressure there will be upwards. Every time you look at special needs, teachers, hospitals, nurses, housing, ask yourself what's happening in Tesco. Thank you. And uh, next speaker, Brandon McCormick. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, uh, just a couple of points, uh, and one of them will be uh, anecdotal. Um, uh, I came to Ireland first of all in 1966, and um, I was born about in Britain uh, uh, in an Irish, an Irish family, and I was often sent on holidays over here to small farms, 
and um, I, I, I loved it. And uh, I decided rather than go to the University of England, I come, I come to Ireland. So I was also one of the working class, um, few working class uh, students in UCD at the time. And I remember one of the priests in the school that I was in, and they were all priests and they were all Irish, said to me, you know, he said, you mightn't like Ireland. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And um, uh, I was in lodgings uh, just off the South Circular Road. And one Sunday morning, I was in my room, and uh, more or less naked, and the next day the door burst open, and the landlady came in and ordered me out to Mass. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I suddenly realised what the man had been talking about. So I lasted just about till Christmas, and uh, finally I arrived one evening to get into the lodgings, and she had locked the door, because I had been um, associating with women who were in a house beside, I used to go in for a cup of tea, and she noticed this. So I ended up in a flat, and I was like, far better off. Um, so that's the only indication of what sort of the country uh, Ireland was at the time. But on a more serious level, um, I suppose I was a, a, a foot soldier in, yes, uh, uh, in the movement at the time of the Gentle, Gentle Revolution. And um, uh, the Housing Action Committee involved, a lot of people were involved in it. The Gentle Revolution was an in-house revolution. It didn't go beyond there. Um, I can remember going up uh, to one of the evening classes and talking to them and trying to get them involved. And I didn't meet exactly with hostility, but there wasn't an awful lot of empathy coming from people who had just done a day's work uh, and were trying to get a degree at night. And here were these privileged people uh, who had plenty of time to go around talking about revolution, socialist revolution and so on. And I can remember talking in the flat I was in with a, a man who came to repair the electricity and talking about it, and he said, of course, you people are privileged. He said, this doesn't really affect us in any way. On the other hand, I think everybody moved. I think there was definitely a movement by everybody. Uh, we were different from the generation that, that went before. Um, and of course, you had the, um, the Vietnam War. Um, you had all the movements in Paris and so on and in America. Um, and you also had another anecdotal story was uh, the fact that um, women weren't allowed to wear um, trousers. Yeah. Yeah. And one day, the word went round that they would all come in wearing, or drink pints. Uh, wearing trousers, no skirts, and, and that was the end of that. The uh, authoritarianism collapsed at, at that stage. Um, but if you look at the housing, the problem remains. Um, if you look at the um, question of health, the problem remains. Uh, I was at the doctor uh, yesterday for a non-threatening um, problem, a non-life-threatening problem, and the doctor said to me, well, we might have to refer you to uh, a specialist. Would you think of going private? Because if you go public, there would be a two-year delay, and if it's urgent, there will only be a one-year delay. Now, this is all going to build up, because this all affects working-class people. Everybody here, I imagine, has got, has got uh, private insurance, and it doesn't make any difference but it has an enormous effect on working class people. So you've got working class people who can't get housing, working class people have great difficulty, but working class people can't get housing. There's a big problem with healthcare, even though a lot of money goes into it. And the whole thing, in my view, is ready to explode. Um, and we saw, we had a, we had a picture of that, um, of, of the possibility uh, during the presidential election. Thank you. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I'll take a couple more speakers and go back to the panel and then we'll, we'll go to the real business of the night, which is the wine reception. <laughs> introduce yourself, please. I'm Declan Collins. Uh, I have three abiding memories of the time. The first was uh, the, the, the march against the Vietnam War. Uh, it was a great festival atmosphere, some beautiful girls there as well, which made it more attractive to go into the actual uh, march. And we, one of the placards said, uh, Peace on Earth, John stood in orbit. The other one said, Hey, hey, LBJ, how many yeah. kids did you kill today? Um, the second memory was what, what my, my late father worked in the sugar company building in statistics office, and I used to get a lift home on this Honda 50. And as we were looking down <laughs> on the terrace, we saw a huge bold letter Such a mode Hey, of open, anti people monster. Now, this was the president of the college. There had been an ancillary, there would be a strike among ancillary workers. And to be honest, Hogan had probably nothing to do with the paying of these guys, but it was up on the wall. And my late father said, in a few years' time, these guys will be in the civil service, the top ranks. Uh, lastly, was the occupation itself. Uh, I was there for some of the big monster meetings inside. 
and the occupation itself continued. My a pal of mine and I were going to sit it out and, and stay overnight, but by about five o'clock we got just got too hungry and drifted off home. So my revolutionary zeal was very limited. Thank you. <laughs> Maureen, did you want to make a few remarks? Well, very nice to see you here. Uh, I recall how you gave a very special welcome, uh, uh, in a radical sense, to President Nixon and showed him the egg-shaped, gave him an egg-shaped view of the world. Uh, I'm not sure if President Trump is going to be here, but I'm, I'm sure if he is, you will, you will greet him in similar, similar spirit. Um, I think we'll return to the panel now. Um, anyone wish to say some closing remarks, Basil? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, I, it's kind of hard to sum uh, this up, so I won't even try. Uh, I had the notion that uh, looking back at uh, what happened then, uh, you know, we've, we've been asked over the years from time to time, the question arises, well, did it achieve anything? And, you know, you could say in the short term very little, but I think that what really happened was the planting of seeds of change, which as time went by, germinated, sprouted and did uh, their work. And we've had quite a number of comments to that effect coming back from people as you know, the committee, the organizing committee for both of these events contacted uh, uh, many of you here, actually. And that seems to be the message. Um, yeah, we didn't really get much done in terms of concrete achievement, but we did uh, add to a ferment which was already beginning and which has flowered as the decades passed. And when I say a ferment, I, I, I do emphasize that because, y you know, it's very easy to get wrapped up in your own bit of the action. But SDA and the activities that we engaged in were just one bit of a jigsaw puzzle, uh, if you want to put it that way, uh, of change. There were many other forces at work. and we were reflecting them really rather than initiating them and that's something which i think the the present generation needs to think about as well it's about when you are engaging uh, in your own um, agitations your own activities uh, promoting your own demands that to reach out uh, elsewhere in society to distinguish to try and find out who else is with you and reach out to them. That, that, is, that is going to be a very important aspect to it. Because I feel there is a break coming. Um, we, we, one of the things that's occurred to me is what, why did we think there could be a revolution at that time, in retrospect? Uh, you had, in fact, about 25 years since the end of the Second World War, I don't mean just in Ireland, but I mean globally, uh, the single longest and biggest boom ever under capitalism. And yet, in 1967, 68, there's a huge revolutionary wave, which, and again, globally, uh, and all over Europe, and preceding 1968, for that matter. So, there are so... Most of the people, at, certainly all the people at college these days, and, and probably most of the population of Ireland, have no experience of something like that. On the contrary, and, and this explains some of the, the problems that Amy was talking about, it's the exact opposite. Because if you look at a very simple uh, historical graph, what happened in those 25 years was that as productivity increased, wages and salaries tracked that productivity increase, pretty much dead on. But with the advent of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and let's not forget uh, their precursors, um, who 
our precursor, I should say, General Pinochet in Chile, the first neoliberal experiment after the Second World War, required a coup to be put into practice. And once that happened, and it actually worked from a capitalist point of view uh, in economic terms, uh, you got this right-wing push, this counter-revolution, which established, what is it now, 40 years of no tracking. Effectively, the population of every country, not exactly being beggared, but certainly being deprived of their share of the cake, I cannot see that that is in any way sustainable. I hear a growing chorus of voices uh, to that effect. And all I can say is, I hope the break, because there is going to be a break, comes in time for me to see it and everyone here to see it as well. Here, here. Just a little bit. I just want to say to Amy, yes, I mean, I think you can make change. Uh, it can often just be in small ways. Um, and so you shouldn't, I, I, it doesn't sound as though you're going to give up <laughs> at all. But I, I think you should just continue. Um, I'm all, also, I think, uh, just, just to give, since, um, since I'm not really familiar with what's happening in Ireland, but if we look at, for example, uh, Bernie Sanders again, because there is a tremendous change in American politics right now. And the, the progressive movement is a large movement. I forget the, num the number of votes that Bernie Sanders got in the primaries when he was in opposition to Hillary Clinton, but we have all these new um, senators in the United States who are now calling themselves progressive. When Bernie Sanders was talking about the $15, hour, $15 an hour wage, it was revolutionary. When he was talking about Medicaid for all, which means that there would be socialized medicine. And by the way, there is socialized medicine in the United States. People seem to forget that. I'm the beneficiary of socialized medicine as, as a senior. Um, and so when he's talking about these things, th this is now becoming accepted policy um, by the left wing of, of, the, Demo of the Democrats, whereas f for three years ago, it was only Bernie Sanders. So if we keep repeating the message, it will get home, but we have to keep repeating it. Yes. <laughs> I think in the words of the late, great Bill O'Hurley, we leave it there, so <laughs> and, uh, on your way out. Can I just, uh, Deglon, could I just yeah, say one thing to yeah, finish Yeah, Frank up? wants to make a I just think remarks. it's really interesting that the three of us took part in the SDA revolution in UCD. It, it, it turned us yes. into serious left-wingers for life. And I'm very glad to be able to say that. Serious, serious, serious troublemakers. Now, uh, yes, I can. The wine is waiting for you. <laughs>